It was 1894 when Queen Victoria wrote, Afterwards we were photographed, I holding the baby on my lap, Bertie and George standing behind me, thus making the four generations. The old queen called him a very fine baby, but soon he was a small boy in a sailor suit. A sailor father, a nautical grandfather, the early discipline of the sea. The young Prince Edward was 16 years old when he walked in the funeral procession of his grandfather, King Edward VII. It was the end of the Edwardian era, the beginning of a new age in which he was to play a prominent, indeed sensational part. With the accession of his father as King George V, the boy prince went to Carnarvon Castle for his investiture as Prince of Wales. A sweltering summer day, he afterwards recalled, with 10,000 people looking on. Winston Churchill as Home Secretary proclaiming his titles and himself half fainting with heat and nervousness. Already his official royal duties were beginning. But soon he went to sea as a midshipman in the Royal Navy. Then came the First World War and an end to peace in his time. A war fought bitterly in trenches and mud. Prince Edward, commissioned as a second lieutenant in the Grenadier Guards, went to the front. He was eager to share the life and danger of the front line of troops. Oh, to be fighting with those grand fellows, he wrote at the time. And it was an early conflict in his life that he was kept back from action. He was forever seeking first-hand experience. Even in the earliest days, when some had doubts about air power, he was enthusiastically air-minded. The war over, the young prince went to Canada for the first of the royal tours for which he became famous. His first days in Canada in 1919, he afterwards wrote, were the most exhilarating I've ever known. Everyone wanted to shake hands with the Prince of Wales, and soon the Prince's right hand was blackened and swollen. And he wrote home that he was using his left hand, having, as he explained, temporarily retired my right hand from imperial service. The next year, aboard HMS Renown to New Zealand, which he afterwards described as the last, loneliest and loveliest of the British dominions. He took very seriously the job he described as one of making himself pleasant, mingling with war veterans, showing himself to school children, catering to official and social demands, and reminding his father's subjects of the ties of the Commonwealth. In Australia, his reception was riotous in its informality and he was greeted with shouts of digger. The Prime Minister there said to the Prince, the people of Australia see in you the things which they most believe. The old Imperial India, which had been described as the brightest jewel in the British crown. He went there in 1921, although efforts were made to boycott his visit. But Edward, in spite of misgivings, carried through a formidable program which he afterwards described as a masterpiece of official planning. Salon and Malaya, he went on for a four-week visit to Japan, where his host was Prince Hirohito, with whom, among other things, he went duck catching and also played golf as a respite from the official duties. 
During the return journey in HMS Renown, there were other moments of informal relaxation. Always a sportsman, always ready to try something new, the heir to the throne got a lot of fun out of the Pacific surf. Back in Britain, he was not shy about playing golf in public. The legend of the sporting prince grew when he took up hunting, which endeared him to the hearts of country people throughout Britain and renewed a royal tradition which had lapsed for many years. But when he started riding in point-to-point -point races, there were misgivings and eventually he had to abandon it. Yet there could be little serious criticism of a prince who was prepared to devote so much time and energy to his former comrades of the First World War. A youthful veteran himself, he had just the right touch for the old soldiers and the disabled. In 1925, he set out on another royal tour aboard HMS Repulse, reaching Cape Town in mid-April, where he was greeted by his uncle, the Earl of Athlone, then Governor General, together with Generals Herzog and Smuts, then leaders of two rival political parties. Whilst in South Africa, he visited the old battlefields of the Boer War. But his particular study was that of the racial problems of the Union. He came away with first-hand experience. This last of his great official tours took him on across the South Atlantic as trade ambassador to the republics of South America. In Montevideo, the troops turned out to welcome him. But it was in matters of trade that this visit to Uruguay, Chile and the Argentine carried special success. To Canada again in 1927 for the Diamond Jubilee of Canadian Confederation. He was accompanied by his brother Prince George and by the Prime Minister Stanley Baldwin. It was Stanley Baldwin who was to play a leading part in the abdication crisis nine years later. Next year, in London, there was a critical period when the old King George V was taken seriously ill, and the Prince of Wales had to rush back from a big game hunting expedition in Africa to be at his father's side. During the long convalescence which followed, the Prince took on a part of his father's royal burden. There were the ceremonial duties, and such events as the opening of the Shakespeare Memorial Theatre at Stratford. It was a period of arduous duty at home with an exacting daily program. But the Prince also followed his own special interests. Since the First World War, he had been keen on aviation. Two of his brothers had taken up flying and now, in spite of protests, the Prince achieved his heart's desire and became a pilot. His activities did much to stimulate public interest in the great developments of the air age. When the DOX, the world's largest flying boat and the wonder of the age came to Britain, he himself piloted it for half an hour. With the 1930s came the Great Industrial Depression. There were two and a half million men unemployed when these mining people waited for a visit from the heir to the throne. The prince made no secret of his concern for the state of the country and of his sympathy for the poverty and poor conditions of the workers. He toured the industrial areas to see for himself. He wouldn't allow himself to be bound by formality. He talked to people and went inside their houses. He knew there was no magic cure for this industrial illness. 
But one of the practical measures was to stimulate British trading abroad. He had that in mind when he went to open the Anglo-Danish trade fair in Copenhagen. came the celebration of the Silver Jubilee of King George V. It was the last magnificent occasion of the old king's reign. He seemed fully recovered in health when he drove through London with Queen Mary. But in fact, his reign was drawing to its close. By the of God, of Great Britain, Ireland, and the British dominions beyond the sea, King, defender of the faith, Emperor of India. Thus began the reign of King Edward VIII, a reign of 325 days. Already loved and respected as prince, he set out to do his duty as king in the industrial areas of Britain. But behind the scenes, the constitutional crisis grew. A crisis which concerned not only politicians of Westminster, but the Church of England, and which was to prevent his coronation. The cause of the crisis was the King's desire to marry Mrs. Wallace Simpson. The King and Mrs. Simpson had been seen together a great deal, and had been photographed together on holiday. At first it was rumored, then it was publicly confirmed that the king wished to make Mrs. Simpson his wife. At 10 Downing Street, the Prime Minister, Stanley Baldwin, opposed the king's desire to marry the woman of his choice. Day after day, the crowds gathered while the cabinet deliberated. Finally, the king was faced with a choice between his throne and the woman he wished to marry. His choice was abdication, which he announced to the world in one of the most moving broadcasts ever made. I have found it impossible to carry the heavy burden of responsibility and to discharge my duties as king as I would wish to do without the help and support of the woman I love. Thus he became Duke of Windsor. And six months later, she became the Duchess of Windsor when they were married at Caen in France. To Britain, with his younger brother George VI upon the throne, came the threat of war. When the men went into uniform, the Duke of Windsor was appointed to the staff of that ill-fated British army in France, which was to leave by way of Dunkirk. When France fell and Europe was overrun by the Nazis, the Duke received a new appointment as governor of the Bahamas, stationed in Nassau, where he and the Duchess took up residence and remained not without a sense of being in exile through the Second World War. In the post-war years, the Windsors divided their time between America and Europe. While Queen Mary was still alive, the Duke paid regular visits to his mother in London. As the years went by, and his niece, Queen Elizabeth, came to the throne, the Duke remained in voluntary exile, less in the limelight than he had ever been in his life. But at least enjoying many of the ordinary pleasures which are denied to sovereigns and those who move within the formal framework of royalty. 